genetic diseases are most of the time passed through recessive genes caused by minor mutations in the DNA. These traits normally have a very small chance of spreading unless both parents possess the recessive traits. That is such a small chance, though, because enough people have enough genetic variety to avoid such a thing. However, there is one way that genetic variety can be massively decreased, inbreeding. Inbreeding is when a animal or human breeds within its genetic relatives. Animals such as dogs, inbreeding can cause certain genetic disorders and mutations to be common. Among purebred dogs, this leads to shorter lifespans, weaker hearts and lungs, bone and joint disease, also problems with the dog's intelligence. The same thing can happen to a human, depending on two factors. One, how genetically related the people are, and two, how many generations the inbreeding happens. Now, historic inbreeding is a very common thing among rich, powerful families who want to keep the wealth within their family. And yes, it was technically illegal, but they did it anyway. Now, one of these families that I will be talking about, in fact, one of the two, is the Habsburgs. Now, before I continue, I need to mention a little term that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is incest. Incest is the societal and legal term for breeding with family that is very genetically close like your siblings, your parents, and yes, that thing happens. Yes, it is disgusting, and yes, it's probably caused by mental disorders. Now, the problem with it is that it also causes genetic descendants to immediately have certain birth defects. And if they don't, it's very likely that their kids will. Outside of people, like your direct siblings and parents, there are also people who still carry your genetic traits. Those are your first cousins, your second cousins, your aunts, your uncles and nieces and nephews, and most places consider marriage or relationships with them to be incest. And I completely agree with this because, of course, it's still way too close to be genetically safe, and two, it's still completely disgusting. Now, what I'm going to be referring to uh, with the Habsburgs, I'm going to be referring to it as inbreeding, not as incest, mostly because incest is a sociological term that has a lot of gray areas that inbreeding just completely gets rid of. And also, it's important to remember that though these people were basically committing incest, they weren't accused of it mostly because they were getting special dispensations from the popes and religious leaders at the time that would allow them to do these sorts of things. Also, they were rich, so they could get away with whatever they wanted. The Habsburgs were a very important family in pretty much all of European history. They started out as a minor Swabian house inside of the Holy Roman Empire, which is a state that I won't get into because it is way too confusing, but essentially by the 1300s they've at least had one of their family members as a Holy Roman Emperor, and they had also become Archdukes of Austria. Now with this title of Archduke of Austria, they would start to grow their power base, and by the 1440s Ferdinand III would become the first really truly Habsburg to actually become Holy Roman Emperor for a long period of time. His son Maximilian would also become Holy Roman Emperor and Maximilian's grandson Charles V would also become Holy Roman Emperor. Now Charles V is someone I will explain in a minute. Now also due to the fact that the Spanish Kingdom had now united under the marriage of Isabella and Ferdinand, a very famous marriage known as the Iberian Wedding, Spain was essentially united under one kingdom. Now, after Ferdinand and Isabella died, their only daughter, Joanna, became queen. She would marry the son of Maximilian named Philip of Austria. And both of these people were very unimportant. Joanna went mentally insane and Philip died. However, the thing that did happen was that three children were born. First was Carl V, or Charles in English. Then there was Ferdinand I and Isabella of Austria. Now, these three were very, very important to our story because all of them would have kids, and these kids would all immediately start the process of inbreeding in the Habsburg family. You see, because after the death of Charles V, the Habsburg dynasty was split in two. You had the Spanish Habsburgs and you had the Austrian Habsburgs, and both sides decided to maintain power within the Empire, it would probably be best they could possibly marry each other, or at least marry each side of the family. 
So Charles V's children and Ferdinand the first children, as well as some of Isabella's children, would eventually all start coalescing into a very, very inbred family. This would start out with Maximilian II, who became Holy Roman Emperor right after Ferdinand died. Maximilian would marry his uncle's daughter, and therefore his first cousin, Maria of Austria. They would have a daughter, Anna of Austria, who would then go on to marry Philip II, Charles's eldest son. Now, Philip was, of course, Anna's uncle, and their son would be Philip III of Spain. Now, Philip III of Spain would marry his uncle's and distant cousin's child, and therefore second cousin, Margaret of Austria. Now, once again, this would produce Philip IV of Spain, probably had some minor genetic disorders. Uh, you can tell by the fact that all Habsburgs essentially had a gigantic bulging forward jaw after Charles V. Now, Philip III's daughter, Maria Anna, would marry her first cousin, Ferdinand III, Holy Roman Emperor, who was also the son of Ferdinand II, Holy Roman Emperor, and his first cousin. Ferdinand III and Maria Anna would marry into Mariana of Austria, who would eventually marry her uncle, Philip IV, producing Charles II. And this is where everything kind of falls apart. At this point, you had gone through four generations of inbreeding, and Charles II was not at all a stable man. Now, Charles II had a couple of problems, and there are many theories on why he had these problems. The first was obviously his inbreeding. All of this inbreeding uh, actually had uh, quite an effect on many family members. Uh, in over 16 generations, a study of 3,000 family members suggested that inbreeding directly led to possibly their deaths. As well as this, recessive genes that had been passed down thanks to inbreeding, had allowed him to get a combined pituitary hormone deficiency, which led to him getting acromelagy, and also he ended up with problems with his kidneys being able to filter urine, which caused a buildup in acid inside his body. He also had a bunch of mental disorders. His health throughout his life caused him to, of course, have epileptic seizures. He was pretty much completely senile, um, and somehow he continued to live on for almost 40 years, completely destroying the power of Spain. He also could barely talk until the age of eight, which is probably due to his very pronounced lip and jaw, which was a common trait among the later Habsburgs, and is also very much due to the inbreeding. When Charles II finally died in 1700, it ended up starting a massive war over his succession called the Spanish War of Succession between the French and the Austrians. It was a long war, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, but it essentially ended with the Spanish Habsburgs coming to an end and the beginning of the Spanish Bourbon dynasty. Now, the Spanish Bourbon or Bourbon dynasty still rules to this very day. In fact, they are now under King Ferdinand VI of Spain. Now, obviously, the fact that this had all happened because of the Spanish and uh, Austrian uh, decision to inbreed to keep uh, most of their royal power within side of the family and not lose any major titles would be a pretty big lesson on why inbreeding was so bad for humanity in general. And it, it, many people still look at it as a case study for how exactly uh, inbreeding could be damaging in the long run, even if it seems like beneficial, if it can even be considered beneficial, in the current time. Now, this next case of inbreeding I'm going to be talking about is going to be very specifically about hemophilia. Now, it's also going to be different than the Austrians because the Austrians and uh, the Habsburgs in general specifically breeded within one family and two branches. This will be more like 10 to 20 families all intermarrying to ensure some sort of marriage pacts between them. Now, this was very common all throughout European history. However, this time it was different because after generations of doing this, it led to less genetic variety inside of the gene pool. Now, hemophilia is a normally inherited uh, bleeding disorder in which the blood does not clot properly. This leads to spontaneous bleeding as well as bleeding following injuries or surgery. Now, the inheritance is normally inherited uh, through the mother uh, because it is an X-linked trait. If the mother is a carrier of the gene, 
it is very likely that if she has four children, that one of them will likely have hemophilia, and one of them will be a carrier for hemophilia. Now, why would this be a problem? Well, it turned out that Queen Victoria ended up being a carrier for hemophilia, and she had tons of children. However, the there are about four that we need to worry about. Now, out of her many children, one would end up getting the actual disease, one of her sons, and two would end up becoming carriers. Now, these carriers were very important. One of them was Alice, who would end up marrying a minor German prince. Their child, though, was Alexandra. Alexandra would end up marrying Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, and although they would produce a lot of daughters, they would eventually make one son, Alexei. Now, Alexei, when he was born, he initially had a couple of problems, but it ended up being that his real problem was the hemophilia he had just inherited from his mother. Now, to treat the hemophilia, his mother contracted the Russian mystic Rasputin. Rasputin would eventually actually treat Alexei's disease to a point of at least not curing it, but to a point where it was manageable. However, he would also try and become an advisor for Tsar Nicholas and for Alexandra. This would end up creating such a huge problem because nobody liked Rasputin in the upper classes of Russia, and in fact, that would be one of the many catalysts for the Russian Revolution of 1917, or the two Russian revolutions of 1917. It's strange how two seemingly random historical events are completely intertwined with each other, but the inbreeding and intermarrying between different royal houses ended up causing actual major European events to happen. The Spanish War of Succession was caused by Habsburg inbreeding, leading to Charles II's ineptitude and death, and Charles II had no kids. At the same time, Alexei's hemophilia led to Rasputin being contracted to treat his hemophilia. This led to to Tsar Nicholas's general unpopularity increasing massively, and his eventual overthrow would also be part of the scandal involving Rasputin. All in all, you can definitely see that there's a certain problem with inbreeding in European history. It affected it to a point where seemingly minor things blew up. Spanish-American independence might not have happened if the Habsburgs continued to rule, or maybe it would have happened earlier, or something else would have happened. It's this cyclical nature of history that allows these things to happen, these minor events and these minor genetic things to intertwine with history. And that is why I find this so interesting.